This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode 611 and we welcome Dr. Paula Olszewski to discuss home chem house observations of microbial and environmental chemistry and her new position dealing with COVID and indoor air quality at Johns Hopkins. So looking forward to a great show. Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. They are the reason we continue to be free. And we have a new sponsor this week, TSI Inc. Learn more at tsiinc.com. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope, the future of IAQ assessment, unlimited sampling, with instant results at instascope.co. Association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at ACGIH.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute at CIRIScience.org, the Indoor Air Quality Association at IAQA.org, Dot org, the Restoration Industry Association at restorationindustry.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at iicrc.org, and Healthy Buildings America 2021 at hb2021-america.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories at aemlinc.com. Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com, Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions at GrayWolfSensing.com, and Healthy Indoors Magazine at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Frank Mortal III. He's the executive director of ACGIH, and he was first to correctly answer our last IQ radio trivia question. The IQ radio trivia question for today, Friday, January 8th, 2020, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how, how to expand your IQ investigations at TSI.com. Here is today's trivia question. Name the philanthropic foundation which believes that a carefully reasoned and systematic understanding of the forces of nature and society when applied inventively and wisely can lead to a better world for all. Back to you, Joe. Good one, Cliff. All right. Dr. Paul Olsuski is a contributing scholar at Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security She's a pioneering leader in policy and scientific research programs in microbiology and chemistry of the indoor environments. Prior to joining Johns Hopkins, during her two decades at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, she led innovative and multidisciplinary programs that inspired, accelerated, and produced lasting impact. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Welcome, Paula. Great to have you on the show. Oh, Joe. Cliff, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about today's, uh, the opportunity today. We are too. We're, we're great to have, I'm just thrilled to have you. I didn't, when I, when I contacted you, I, I had seen a notice somewhere that you had a new position. I was like, wow, I, I didn't expect that. Um, but I guess I should have. I knew that home chem wasn't going to last forever, but let's, let's talk a little bit about your new position first, and then we'll go into home chem in more detail. Uh, well, my- tell us what you're doing now. All right, so my new position is a very exciting one. I'm a contributing scholar at the Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Health Security, where I am leading a team, a multidisciplinary team, to develop pandemic policy for indoor air. And it's a really exciting opportunity for me because I think it builds on all of the work that I did, not all, but most of the work that I did at the Sloan Foundation, starting with bioterrorism and biosecurity, pandemic preparedness, 
trying to understand indoor microbiology through the microbiology of the built environment program, and then through the chemistry of indoor environments programs. So it's, um, it, it's very uh, nice when, you know, things that you, just subjects you've been passionate about all come together. And, un, and now it's under unfortunate circumstances. I mean, this pandemic is terrible, but um, the work that I've done and, and many, much of the work of the grantees really has been very helpful to sort of uh, some of the things that we know need to be done scientifically with regard to indoor air. And I want to point out that in 2014, Professor Jordan Pechia of Yale uh, organized a workshop in Singapore to bring together a bunch of the Sloan grantees who were studying various built environments um, and looking generally at just, you know, the the microbes that live there, not looking at harmful ones. But he said, you know, let's team up with the infectious disease people and let's let's have a workshop in Asia where there's a big commitment uh, to indoor air because I'm just they they have all these huge buildings, many places such as Singapore, it's tropical. And so uh, brought together a workshop of different people who now I, when I look at who is there, I said, wow, this is, this is, is, is really part of the uh, indoor air response team. Uh, people like, Shelly Miller were there, Lydia Maraska, a um, whole bunch of people. I don't need to go into all of them, but it was, they were not anticipating a pandemic, but they were already discussing infectious disease indoors. What do we know? What do we not know? And then there was another important workshop that I just want to mention that sort of ties all of this together. And the this Sloan Foundation, generally gets into a program for five or 10 years, 25 to $50 million, move the, move the field and then get out. And so we were finishing up on the uh, microbiology of the built environment program, where we learned that, that buildings are indoor ecosystems influenced by occupancy, design and operation. And the, a number of people in the program wanted to study viruses. Yet when we gave the first grants to that program in the mid to late 2000s, sequencing and the te techniques that people were using is they were um, pulling together whatever genetic material was in the sample and then sequencing it. And, and sequencing the DNA at that time was extremely expensive. So mm. I had made a decision that it was too expensive to study viruses because we didn't have any marker genes. And for bacteria, there were marker, it was just cheap. So now we come to, we're near the end of the program. And uh, this time one of, Jord one of Jordan Pecci's students, um, Kyle Bibby, who, who's now on the faculty at Notre Dame um, with Lindsay Marr, uh, again, I, I, they asked me about it, I encouraged them and they, put together a workshop called Viruses in the Built Environment. Lindsay had been doing a lot of work on flu, indoors. Uh, Kyle had been doing work on what's in sort of the water built environment. And they held this workshop in 2019 and published the paper in early 2020. And what was interesting about that that workshop had people from other, other funders, US government, universities, some Sloan grantees, some people I haven't heard. But again, this particular workshop, um, the, the people there laid out a research agenda about what we knew and what we didn't know about viruses in the built environment. And so, mm -hmm. what, so we were not expecting SARS-CoV-2 to be raging um, yeah. a year after that workshop. But it, again, I want to just stress the importance that funders such as the Sloan Foundation and other funders that fund research, very basic research, that it's often can be very helpful in situations you don't anticipate. So this, has been, this is an example that then now we have the pandemic 
and that the National Science Foundation and other funders who had a lot of money to spend on uh, on trying to understand what was SARS-CoV-2 doing in the built environment, um, they had some a, a nice little research agenda to follow. So again, I credit um, you know the vision of the people who who established that those workshops to this contribute going forward. And so I can't say enough about professors at universities. They they help us find the way. You know, you're you're really good at spreading around the, the kudos for people, but I, I think sometimes that leads to you being overlooked a little bit. Um, I don't think people realize your background and, and that you are a PhD in, in chemistry, I believe it is. Uh, yes. And, uh, you know, you, you've been passionate about this for many years. What led to your interest in chemistry in the first place and, and your passion on this topic? Well, I was one of those little kids that always was interested in science. And my parents didn't go to college, but they saw this. So, you know, I was growing crystals as a young girl. And I had some book about experiments, like, you know, if you put salt in water, did the water freeze and so on. And so I first thought I wanted to be a botanist. And I like to read biographies. So I thought I wanted to be a botanist. But in high school, I had this extraordinary chemistry teacher who was tough but wonderful <laughs> and I took two years of chemistry and that just it was just so interesting and so compelling so that sort of really launched me in my interest in chemistry and I'm also uh, the other I'm very practical so it's sort of it, it it's always interesting to think about like well we need to do this basic research but is there some greater purpose you know that and so on so uh, I think that has helped me in my career. I also, also really like people. I like meeting people. I like learning about what they do. And most people, um, even if in a field I've never heard of or in a discipline or whatever, uh, I, I enjoy hearing about what they're doing. And that has been probably one of my most helpful attributes at creating community, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary communities that instead of getting each other like, oh, I need you to make a couple measurements for me, Joe, and oh, Cliff, can you do this? It's more getting the people like, this is how I think about the problems and other people, well, this is how I, and together they come up with new approaches. And it really has been uh, extraordinary what you can do. Now, with your current, I wanna get into the home chem in a moment, but with your current position, is that part of, um... You know, hospitals oftentimes will have some community. Uh, they, they give money back to the community in, in different ways. Is that part of what this is, this division of Johns Hopkins about? All right. Now, the Center for Health Security was founded um, in the late, uh, I, I want to say 1999, 1998, uh, by D.A. Henderson, who is a, uh, an amazing figure in public health leader, who was credited for earlier in his career with stamping out smallpox. Mm. And there are other people who can give more detailed um, histories of the center, but they, um, they're, the Biological Weapons Convention was signed in 1969. So all the countries that signed it said, we're, we're never gonna use biological weapons. All right. So apparently there were some uh, defectors from the fo former Soviet Union who revealed um, at the time in some confidential or classified way uh, that the, uh, there, were <laughs> there were biological weapons being made. So mm -hmm. when uh, DA found out about this, he was very concerned and so the original name for the center was something like the Center for Civilian Biodefense, just thinking about the rest, the rest of the world and so on. And the Sloan Foundation, Ralph Gomery, who was the president at the time, um, Ralph had, had already identified this as a potential area of interest. Mm -hmm. And somehow I, I would say life is a job interview. I was over at the Sloan Foundation helping someone else get money and I ended up getting a job. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> anyway, 
was, I was there in July and I was working in October. But um, Ralph had said to me when he when I was there, I said, well, he asked me, what do you think about bioterrorism? And I said, I don't. So I arrived there and he said, Paul, how'd you like to work on bioterrorism? I said, I'd love to. So anyway, so that's a long story of like, and it turns out that this foundation had just funded the center. So I worked very closely with the center uh, through our whole, the whole time Sloan had a bioterrorism biosecurity program uh, through, I'm gonna say um, 2010 or 11. We had some other work in synthetic biology and that it, the easy definition for that is, if you can if you can recreate organisms from genetic information what are some issues you should address okay so mm -hmm. that uh, and so the center did some very interesting good work on that uh and so on but then I, again as i was saying uh, before the show once you get involved with this work it's very hard to um forget about it so you know i even though the sloan foundation had moved on and by then we were uh, we were getting funding work on synthetic biology and the microbiology of the built environment. I, through various committees and different work, you know, opportunities, um, sort of managed to stay in the field. So I don't know, Joe. What, so where do I go now? <laughs> well, I think it's interesting that I didn't realize that connection between Sloan and Hopkins and and how you got started. And I I forgot you were in bioterrorism years ago too. So it's kind of come full circle for you here. Right. And we're trying to make buildings safer against biological threats. And that's when I start, I, um, I mean, Ralph was really prescient. He, and he said, he um, brought in a, a fellow trustee from some institution he was on, who was like a major owner of like all of these, you know, gigantic buildings in New York city and with two engineers, one who actually worked for him and one who worked for the consulting firm. And Ralph said, you know, if you're, we're worried about an attack outdoors, you know, coming into the building, is there anything we can do to the HVAC system? And, you know, is there some low cost thing that we can do? Not, it's not gonna eliminate the threat. So anyway, um, that's why, so, I meet with these people and I said, well, you know what? I really don't know anything about HVAC systems. Um, you know, can you show me one? So the next <laughs> thing I know, I was um, going up in a high hoist, wearing a hard hat. I was like terrified and also afraid I was gonna get motion sick um, in a 47 story building that was almost done, but the elevators weren't commissioned yet. So we had to go up. But anyway, so that I started learning about HVAC systems and so on. and uh, that so you know at that point these engineers figured out you could tweak the system by adding a little bit better, better filtration and making sure the air went through the system it didn't cost much so that could reduce the threat there and then the people were thinking about okay um, we had all of these you know sensors we had federal programs and they were getting false positives they're like what's going on you know, we're not under attack. And so um, we, at that point, approached several, several very prominent uh, people who were studying environmental microbiology, Craig Venter and Norman Pace, and asked them if they would like to move indoors. And fortunately, they both said yes. And uh, because while the feds we're worried about biological tax and needle in the haystack. Nobody knew what was in the haystack. Ah, uh, okay. So that's how we got started. So. Okay. Now let's let's go to the home chem project. A oh wait, bit. let's talk. Let me just tell you how, what I'm doing at Hopkins. Okay, because this uh, is very yeah. exciting. All right. So, the um, we we know the virus lingers in the air. There was a major disconnect between the medical and public health community and the aerosol physicists, the HVAC engineer. They were just operating on different planets. And so here we have this terrible pandemic. We have all of these people literally working night and day. 
But most of the people in the medical community and public health community were armed with information from like the 1930s and 40s about just different basics about aerosol physics and so on. And the challenge was that they did not rec- the the major bodies, the World Health Organization, uh, the US CDCs would not recognize that the virus was airborne. They said it was in a droplet, went to the ground, that was it. And you would get sick from either touching a surface through fomites or from close contact. But, but it, the, um, the data didn't add up in terms of why people were, would get sick. And then again, there were all these aerosol scientists and, and Lydia Maraska um, from Australia and Don Milton from the University of Maryland, who've been working in this space on infectious agents and aerosol size. And when you talk how far particles go and all sorts of things uh, led an effort. And, and I wanna say, you know, over almost like 280 scientists signed it. And I was one of the scientists that signed it. It said, it's time to recognize that this is airborne. All right, so that hampered our response for a long time. And the fact that people don't, still have trouble recognizing that the virus lingers in the air makes it difficult because people are fixated still on hand washing and surfaces. The hand washing is good. That, I'm, I'm, I'll never be against hand washing, but the obsession with cleaning surfaces, people don't get it from fomites. You don't get sick. You, but if it's lingering, you're better off buying an air cleaner rather than cleaning your surfaces. So that's basically how I ended up. So again, I've been working in this space. The people at the center, uh, you know, again, I admired their work. I had a conversation with them and we were, both sides were thrilled that I was willing to take on this project because people need to understand that it is in the air and there are things you can do to limit your risk, but no one thing is perfect. That's why we need the layered approach. Gotcha. And I, I think it's slowly coming around, but you're right. I, and I didn't think of it that way for many months. People just didn't, didn't realize the, you know, the airborne transmission was going to be such a huge issue. What um, I think maybe, well, what I'd like to do is maybe kind of finish the first half on this and, okay. and, and your current position and then go into the second half on home camp. Um, what are the plans in your current position for helping to get the word out that it's, you know, airborne transmission is a big issue and what types of. Well, early, I, I had a transition at the Sloan foundation. So I was able to start working um, at the center while I was winding down my work at Sloan. And so I, and again, so uh, this, one of the center's processes for developing policy and writing reports is they, they interview a lot of experts to try to understand experts, what's in the literature, and so on. So we started interviewing people, and I, I'm Joe and Cliff, I know you're not surprised that I would know lots of people who are experts in this area who, um, as one of the analysts said, well, Paula, people usually don't say yes immediately to these calls. But anyway, I was very fortunate. I had very good relationships and that the, the people were willing to share their expertise uh, with the team. And um, so I'm working on this. And then I was with a friend who is this brilliant surgeon. She says, how come I don't know anything about this? Hmm. So I said, hmm. So I, I wrote a letter to family and friends and I, I took a long time on this. It was just sort of like, okay, just saying virus is airborne. You know, here are some th- simple things you can do. Uh, but I, cause I said, gee, I'm doing all this stuff yet. My family and friends, if they don't understand a few things that they can do, why to wear a mask, you know, why distancing is important, how you can clean your air, how you can do serious. So I, I write a two page letter and um, then I send it out to people, but I share it with the people at the center. I said, you know, I, I sent this to my family and friends. They're like, whoa, this is great. Uh, you should, you should uh, 
should do a threaded tweet. And I said, well, you know, I, li- I like Twitter, not, I haven't really done that. Anyway, the amazing um, her communications person there, Margaret Miller, helped me with it. All right. So I set up this tweet at, I don't know, 8.30 in the morning. And then I go about doing whatever I'm doing. And the head of the center, Dr. Thomas Inglesby, is texting me at like 11.30. Your tweet has gone viral. Huh. And this was before Thanksgiving. And then working with other people on the team, Dr. Gigi Garnval, we wrote an op-ed that appeared in USA Today before Thanksgiving about making your home, the air in your home safer. And, you know, we, we were not, we were, we said, yes, CP should follow CDC guidelines. But if you look at the data, people are going to the airport they are traveling, they are going to spend time indoors with loved ones. And as my nephew said, you know, Paula, you got to show people how to do it. Abstinence doesn't work. So anyway, <laughs> uh, but again, you know, again, you, you need to wear masks, you need to do distancing and so on. But if you really need to be with people who aren't your family indoors, here are some simple things. So I, I'm sure lots of people either made the Rich Corsi, Jim Rosenthal, you know, um, box with a, you know, furnace filter and a box fan sure. to filter their air, or they went out, and, you know, there are plenty of companies selling good HEPA air cleaners, but just these are things you could do. So um, anyway, so we're, we're working on um, some short, you know, one pagers as well as a full report, recognizing that many people who write policy aren't going to read the full report. So the one pager becomes very important. But again, focusing on schools, because it seems after just talking to so many of the experts, it's like we really need to know how to get schools reopened safely. Yes. And what I've learned, and maybe, you, you know, you, Joe, you and Cliff already know this, and many of your listeners know this, I hadn't appreciated how poor the indoor air quality is in so many of our schools. Yeah. before the pandemic. That's so I'm it's worse, yeah. I, so I'm hoping that, you know, we can, again, armed with the information of all the experts and then with these, this amazing team um, at Hopkins, which includes an economist to say, okay, we, we spend money on this, what, what we get for it and so on, an anthropologist uh, and so on, just to how to do this. You know, I hope we're effective because we need to get through this pandemic People are lonely. People want to be together. We, so how can people be safer? But also, it's like, why is it right that our kids spend all day in polluted air in school? Like, right. who thinks that's a good idea? Sure. Why do we overlook that? Do you think it's so I'm now better? more passionate about indoor air than I ever was. Yeah, really. It's, it's come full circle from the bioterrorism to the home cam, now back to, to viruses. And, uh, exactly. What, what are some real quick tips that maybe you didn't think of before and now that you've been looking at this and working with all these great researchers that you recommend for your own family? All right. So I have portable air cleaners, which, again, size to the room, the HEPA-based ones. I got some fancy ones that have sensors. I got some less fancy so now I just say, you don't need the fancy ones, but I'm going to, and I don't even know if these sensors are any good, but at least they, I enjoy looking at them. Uh, I have a CO2 meter. And what has been interesting to me when I started working on this, I was trying to figure out what is the air exchange rate in my home? Now, I, I live in a New York City apartment built after the 1918 influenza pandemic. And there was an article uh, that appeared last summer that talked about how whoever you know was designing apartment buildings in New York City designed them with big windows, good cross ventilation, and gigantic radiators. And so I'm in one of these apartment buildings that like you just like you have to have the windows open in the winter because you just can't shut off the radiators. Mm-hmm. Now we've had some, you know, we've there are some different um, things that have happened you know, in that time. So we, I now can control the radiators, but uh, I was, I was calling up Rich Corsi, like, Rich, like, how do I know what my uh, air exchange rate is or whatever? So we, we haven't determined that, but I do have a CO2 meter 
And I can see if I have family in sitting in my room, I can see the levels go up with the people exhaling and I open the windows and see the levels go down. I now can tell when I'm cooking uh, that the CO2 level, even though my kitchen is not attached to my dining room, that you know the, um, the CO2 and the particles move quickly, even though I have a very good um, a range hood. And now I've actually more, <laughs> moved more to cooking on the back burner. So again, I, I have the CO2 meter just to kind of see how things are going. I have air cleaners. And um, after a conversation with Jim Rosenthal on filters and particles, uh, I literally just purchased a particle counter as my next, I'm not recommending that for family, sure. but I always say if people are in your home who don't live there, everyone should wear masks and you know, be distant, have your air cleaner on, open the windows. One thing I think we need to, maybe your group or some other group needs to focus on a little more, I haven't seen enough of this, is if someone is ill in your family, how to set up a, an isolation room essentially for those people. Um, well, it, it, you know, it, they're actually, they're Kevin Vanden Weimellenberg who runs a, the biology and the built environment center and a, another center that's name is escaping me at the university of Oregon. He was a grantee and they tackled this early on and they have a video somewhere that again, it, you know, it, it really depends on what your living situation is, but yes. if you can put someone in a bedroom that has its bathroom attached to it, you know, can you basically have a fan that's just, you know, sort of pulling air through the room out through the bathroom so that if you're in there um, shedding the virus, it's going out the window. So, yeah. so Kevin has, um, a video on that somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where it is, but it's your University of Oregon. And I don't know if he's listening, but I suspect he would, uh, you probably find it somewhere on their website. But, we you know, others, others are, again, have like talked about that in terms, because you want to, you know, stay away. And again, if you're sick, wear a mask because you don't want to be transmitting it. Um, you know, it. Close range transmission seems to be a big problem. And you could still use filtration in that room as well. Yes, yes. Oh, no, all, the other things too, but I'm just in terms of, I was trying to bring up something that was a little bit sure. different than we talked about. I've got to stop and thank our sponsors. And then we'll be back for the second half of our interview. We've got Dr. Paula Olszewski. I hope I got your name right too. Because you, I do. Have, you do, you yeah. <laughs> do. Good, because I got a good Polish background myself. So I'm pretty good at those names. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we'll be back in two minutes with the second half of our interview. We're going to talk a lot more about the Home Chem Project in the second half. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope. Do more jobs faster with the future of IAQ assessment technology, unlimited samples, instant results, and cloud-based data at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World at AIHA.org, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, interested in defining their science at acgih.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research at siriscience.org. That's C-I-R-I science.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association, promoting the exchange of indoor environmental quality information through education and research at iaqa.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders at restorationindustry.org. The Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, IICRC at IICRC.org. Healthy Buildings America 2021. Honolulu, Hawaii, August 10 through 12, 2021 at HB. 2021-america.org. Our industry sponsors, AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and no rush fee. Learn more at aemlinc.com. Particles Plus, particle counters and air quality instrumentation, 
Count on us at ParticlesPlus.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions. For over 20 years, Gray Wolf has manufactured accurate, reliable IAQ instrumentation for portable, short-term, and continuous monitoring at GrayWolfSensing.com. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry pros and consumers at HealthyIndoors.com. All right, we're back. We're going to have the second half of our interview. Dr. Paula Olsuski. Dr. Paula, let's first go over what was the, the goals of the home cam. And then if you would, maybe you could go into some of the like most important findings and, or maybe the most surprising things that uh, you learned during this project. How, how long has the project been going on, by the way? The Sloan program in indoor chemistry started in, I believe, 2012 or 2013. Home okay. Chem took place in 2018, and the program will conclude at the end of 2023. I'm, I think it's a, about a $25 million program. And again, it, the, the program has been very successful quickly because the levels of various uh, compounds that people are looking at indoors are just much higher than outdoors. So Home Chem is a very, very interesting um, field campaign. Now it had, there were several goals and two of the goals are, are um, a little different from, than what you're expecting. One of the goals was to create a community of researchers that mm -hmm. would know each other, would work together because if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I don't know whose quote that is, but I found that to be very true. And so planning a field campaign really does create community and figuring out who needs electricity and whose sampling port goes where and, and so on. So that, that's very interesting. Another um, issue that Home Chem was tackling was the issue of data sharing. Uh, we had spent a lot of time looking, working with the life scientists who are very open to sharing their data freely. The, the chemistry community is not, but in a field campaign, they are willing to share data. So the way Home Chem came about is we had uh, funded uh, Nina Vance, uh, who was at a, you know, an early career faculty at the, at the University of Colorado Boulder. And actually the way I met her was through one of her mentors, Lindsay Moore. Uh, and so Nina was tasked with trying to figure out how to develop a network. Um, I had met Delphine at a workshop organized by Glenn Morrison early on in the program uh, in terms of, you know, just sort of what are the ideas and so on. And it was a, a program sponsored by Sloan and the National Science Foundation that took place in Lille, France. And I've never had such good food in my entire life at a <laughs> workshop. But at that meeting, I met um, Delphine Farmer. And again, she's an, an extraordinary um, atmospheric chemist. And she was really good on data. And so we funded her to, to work on, like, how are we going to get the people to share data? And as I think I've mentioned, one of my uh, strengths is just sort of getting people to work together. And I said, you know, Nina and Delphine, I think you should um, talk to each other in just in about what your Nina is trying to set up this network. Delphine's trying to set up the data. And so they came to me and said, we know how to do this. We need to do a field campaign. My first response is, I don't think I have enough money, but we did have <laughs> enough money. And so then it, the idea was like, what, where could we do this field campaign? And what, what questions should be explored. And the, if they were trying to identify a location and they said, well, did you ever hear of this test house at the University of Texas? I'm like, yeah, I've been in there. I know all these people. So anyway, so again, my network was very helpful so that uh, the team at UT Austin, Rich Corsi was still there, Attila Novoselic and so on. I said, you know, talk, you need it in Del So I have introductions there. And then, you know, what are you going to study and how to make it simple? And so I like to have people over. I like to cook. 
I like to have people in my dining room, so occupancy. And I don't like cleaning so much, but you have to clean either before and after. So there are far more detailed scientific explanations uh, if you go to the Indoor Chem website and look at Home Chem. But basically, what is the chemistry that takes place because indoors because of cooking or because of cleaning or because of occupancy? And they brought together, this campaign brought together over a dozen, I think maybe 20 um, institutions, most universities, some government, uh, and there were like 60 researchers on site. Uh, they were, and there was four and a half million dollars worth of equipment and trailers around this, uh, the UT uh, test house, which is a, yeah, pre-manufactured home, about 1,200 square be- feet, three-bedroom ranch. It, in some ways, it's sort of typical in that I think there are 22 million homes in the country like this. Mm-hmm. But what was great about it is because it was uh, an instrument, it wasn't a home, that the, team, the Rich, Attila, and so on team at UT Austin really knew a lot about how the HVAC worked. So they could control things very well for the chemists. Because if you're gonna do a chemical reaction, like in the air, if you have 12 air changes per hour, you don't have much time to do the reaction. Whereas if you have a half air change per hour, you have a lot more time. So anyway, it was very important. And so this um, this project, the, the chemists and the buildings people um, really had to, talk to each other to sort of develop the whole program. But anyway, it was very exciting. And uh, they um, they had um, two Thanksgiving meals because it, it, that's sort of a common um, holiday people like to celebrate. And one of the things that I always thought you were tired after Thanksgiving dinner because of the turkey but it turns out the CO2 levels are like really, really high. Uh, And um, the, you know, in terms of what's emitted during cooking, it's like, whoa, if I wasn't using my uh, range hood, just, yes, there's a lot to study there. And then in terms of cleaning, it was a little tricky that they were studying bleach cleaning and they were studying, um, it's like, I don't know what to call it, pine, some terpene-based cleaning. And um, to get the experiments done properly, it turned out you really, in most cases, needed to have the same person doing the cleaning. I mean, they they could say we have, you know, a liter and a bucket, and at the end we've used so much and so on, but it it became important just to control that. So anyway, so they have already have over a dozen public scientific publications. They probably have a dozen more. And again, there's all sorts of, um, you know, details that we're learning and that, you know, if (laughs) another thing I've learned, if you're doing any cleaning with any cleaning agents, you need a lot of ventilation because a lot can happen indoors. (laughs) Well, and that's tough for some of our listeners because they do cleaning as a profession. Yes. They may not have much control over the ventilation in the buildings they're working in. So I, I, you're, you're building a baseline of information. And by the way, I want to mention, correct me if I'm wrong, all of these studies and papers are public, publicly available. You don't have yes. to. Yes. I, I thought that was so cool that you did that, Paul, and that, that Sloan did that because oftentimes we've got to try and get a paper to discuss with someone and it's tough to do if you're not part of a university or something like that. So they're all public domain. They're all, well, actually, I, sh- I should say most of them are because okay. the, you know, the, the whole, there are fees associated with open access and often they're like $3,000 to, it could be higher, could be lower. And, um, when I was running the program, I would budget for that. But if you have a lot of papers, then maybe you don't have enough money to, maybe you budgeted for three, but you had six papers, so on. Uh, But anyway, I I generally would, if I thought a paper that was really exciting and important and of broad interest, and it wasn't published in an open access way, I usually was able to scrape up some money so that it could be. Because you just, it's, more people can learn from it. More people can benefit from it. 
Right. And that's what you're trying to do is build a foundation that others yes. can build on top of, you know. And and I was surprised personally, you know, when I looked at the papers that were coming out, and I've done indoor air quality for years in the field, you know. I mean, right. Uh, and I learned a lot of things that I didn't realize about the chemistry that that a lot of times we don't think about the chemistry as much as we do the biologicals, especially those of us out in the field. What kind of things do you think were learned from the project that can apply for those of us in the field looking at indoor air quality, trying to determine what types of issues may be causing people's health issues? I think we need a lot more research before I can answer that. Okay. But fortunately, fortunately, the Sloan Foundation, the EPA, CDC, and I can't remember who else is the funder, is funding a National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine research study. So it's a consensus study where they're going to uh, to examine examine the emerging science of indoor chemistry and develop a research agenda. So what do we know, what, and so on. Because why do we care? Because that's where the people are. I mean, and in terms of, you know, as you had mentioned, um, sometimes people are in, are in indoor environments for work that they don't get to, they don't get to control the ventilation, they don't get to whatever. So how can, you know, you either have safer products or how can you mitigate some of these things? So I think those things, you know, mitigating exposure is really important. Again, the Sloan program fa focuses on sort of like the basic, trying to understand the chemistry of what's there and what happens, how does it change? A very important element of the program is the incorporation of modelers. As much as I would love to do as many experiments as possible, sometimes you just can't either you physically can't do it or financially can't do it. But if you work with modelers, they often then can test different conditions that you can't run in the lab while they also can take your data from the lab and they come up with all sorts of new findings. So I'll give an example of the, of the work between modelers and um, experimentalists. So polyaromatic hydrocarbons, they're bad. You don't want you don't want them. All right. And there's all sorts of books on polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Well, Teen and the Sloan Foundation, um, John Abbott and his group at uh, the University of Toronto, Manabu Shirewa at uh, University of California, Irvine, and there are other people involved in this. But basically, John Abbott was studying oxidation of polyaromatic hydrocarbons, you know, basically burning a slow burn of them. All right, and why, why couldn't he get them to, like it, all of the material to be oxidized? Working with the modelers, they determined that the oxidation products formed a crust so that this material was no longer available. Oh. So now if you're doing exposure models, you can say, oh, no, there's this level of whatever, it's going to kill me, or maybe not. But maybe it's not going to kill you if it, it's already been oxidized and it's sort of protected under there. I don't know if, if that will turn out to be the scientific finding, but it's also sort of understanding some of the physical chemistry uh, that you know, what are the properties of the well, different and the, things. And the physical chemistry in the real world. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And that was something I got out of the program. I, I can't, like, you know. No, there's, the there's so, <laughs> there's just so much, you know, you know, why do um, hydrophobic compounds stick to glass? All right, yeah. which, all right, and Vicki, there's like a whole, there's paper, there all sorts of press on that. Um, you know, in terms of what type of bonding takes place and just really interesting chemistry. But you can only learn that when you have both the people doing the experiments and the people modeling the work. And um, sometimes it, it, when started the program, the modelers, I asked them what they wanted. They just said, oh, it would be great if we had the data before it were published. And um, 
fortunately, not, since the modelers and the experimentalists work together, that's it. And one of the frustrations, though, is that, I mean, the, I think all recognize that they're learning much more together. But yeah. uh, some of the people are anxious to publish and like, well, we need to get more modeling results. It's, that's why it's taking longer. But, I'd, but it's worth waiting for. So it's been very, very, um, and again, so there's a whole modeling consortium uh, that's involved. And the modelers always say, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to take measurements. But there yeah. are several key people on the modeling team who used to be experimentalists. So they understand how hard it is to generate data. I like to say that was one of the key things I learned is that there are so many reactions we just don't know about in the right. environment and, and what the byproducts are. Hey, we're going to go to what we call a roundup here and uh, ask a few final questions and wrap things up. John, go ahead and play the music if you would. All right, John. Hey, Cliff, let me, let me make sure you have, if you have any final questions, um, let, let me give you a chance to jump in here. I do, Paul. I would like, um, I would like your comments on two things that I'm going to suggest. And it seems to me that we know a lot about supplements that, that people can take and that, you know, some of these supplements are beneficial in terms of improving immune systems and so on. So I just can't understand why no one makes recommendations, uh, you know, publicly for, for this stuff, because I do think that uh, we do know enough about it that we could, you know, prevent uh, you know, some of the illnesses uh, you know, that people are experiencing, particularly with COVID. And the second thing is um, whether or not you've introduced uh, additional humidity, tried to maintain humidity in your home or whatever, and you know, to get it up around that comfort zone of 50% because it's so dry. Uh, in the winter. So right. those well, are my happy, two questions. Happy to answer those questions. First of all, I take supplements, <laughs> but um, there, there's some expression, you know, about uh, supplements don't work, but people who take them are healthier. All right. So any that I take, <laughs> I take, okay. you know, upon the recommendation of my uh, doctor. Okay. okay. Humidity. Yes. I, I, it, I have, uh, several humidifiers in my home and it is it is hard to keep your humidity um, up in the in the um, when it's cold and dry mm -hmm. I have not I was like, and when I wrote my original letter and my uh, tweet thread that went viral I I included humidity but now mm -hmm. now I I bring it up afterwards because what happened is several people I love dearly got humidifiers and then forgot about everything else. Mm -hmm. All right. And it, and again, it's, you, you can't just, and it was interesting to me. We, I talked to a uh, communications expert and she said, Oh, we see that often. It's when people have a whole series of things to do that they can't cope with, they do one and feel like they're, they're done. So mm -hmm. I, I, so I, it's like, well, you, you've got to wear the masks indoors. You've got to distance. And, you know, like, how about a HEPA air cleaner? All right. Mm -hmm. And then it, so, and also like the humidifiers, I mean, again, identifying the right one, you know, for your home or for your room and, and whatever um, that can be done. Yeah. But it's just, so anyway, so I do have humidifiers. I have come to recognize how hard it is to keep the humidity up around 40%. Uh, and, um, but I try, but again, but I don't, I want people to think about ventilation, filtration and air cleaning before they think about humidification. Yeah, no, no argument for me. And the key is don't forget to clean your humidifier because uh, <laughs> they do get dirty and they do get stuff growing. Exactly, around. exactly. It's maintenance is something a lot of people forget about. And that's a, right. it's a vital thing. I mean, we've got to maintain these things. All right. So what I'd like to kind of do is, is if you could maybe summarize for us what you learned for, or where we're headed, I guess, as far as home chem, you said there's still three more years of right. re work going on. 
what can we look forward to seeing over the next three years come out? All right. So there's, I guess I said, there's going to be another dozen papers about their findings that um, will come up because it takes a while to really crunch all the data and share it and whatever. And so there'll be a lot more new knowledge. And then uh, it's been delayed because of COVID, but the team is going to have another field campaign, this time at the NIST test house in Gaithersburg, Maryland. So it's in partnership with the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Um, I think Dustin Poppendink is the, the lead there. Uh, you know, professors Vance and uh, Farmer are, you know, the they leads on the, uh, on the other side and it's called CASA. Chemical, let me just look at this. I always do, I keep forgetting what, uh, chemical assessment of surfaces and air. Mm. And we, and I realized the time has flown by. We never got to talk about how things come out of the air. They go on the surfaces, chemistry happens, and then they go back into the air. Surface chemistry plays a huge role in indoor air quality. I'm glad you brought that up. That's, a, that's an excellent, uh, excellent point. The other thing I, if I recall correctly from, talking with you in the past and doing the show we did in, uh, at the University of Texas. Part of the um, reason for the whole project and the way it was designed was that you were hoping, I think, that people would kind of take off with it and, and use that foundation and right. kind of take off with that foundation into other directions. How's that been going? Well, I think it's, you know, we're in a pandemic. Many of the uh, university laboratories were shut down or with the, you know, with just this social distancing guidelines, you can, you have only fewer graduate students. So uh, that has, that has slowed the scientific enterprise, not just for um, the Sloan, the Sloan indoor chemistry programs, but others. Um, On the other hand, given my, expertise in um, pandemics. Uh, I did write a paper with, uh, with Dick Garwin and Steve Morrison, 2006, you know, what to do before the vaccine arrives. Um, I, um, you know, worked with all of the grantees t- to make sure they had it, to, on many cases gave them no cost extensions because the pandemic was so disruptive to the research that mm-hmm. they could, you know, they could do a lot of What's good is they've been able to write papers, analyze data, but it's yeah. slowed that the next round of experiments. But I'm, you know, again, they, 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 there's, you know, and three full years of um, experiments that have been funded. I think the the National Academy study will be very, um, uh, you know, will will come up with a research agenda, and it's great to have partners of EPA and CDC on that. I can't remember who the other partners are, but there's a website that you can go to um, and learn all about that. And the meetings generally are, are open. So you, you probably can hear some great indoor chemistry talks. I may have to come down and cover that because that's close enough for a, a quick drive, uh, you know, down into Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, exactly. right. And hopefully by then it, it'll be much easier to do things. Yes, I sure hope so. I think uh, hopefully this vaccine is going to, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Is the vaccine going to help us get through this or are we not going to get enough acceptance that, um, you know. Just, oh, the vaccine uh, will help us. But before we get the vaccine, we need all these layered approaches, masks, distancing, ventilation, filtration, air cleaning, hygiene. We just, and we have to be vigilant. Humidification. Humidification. So. Sorry. I did, all right. But again, right. the whole, just, you know, <laughs> just try to stay with it. Hey, before we go, uh, is there anything that we missed that you'd like to add? I know we didn't, we didn't get to spend nearly enough time going into a deep dive on some of the home chem stuff, but I, you know, is there anybody you wanted to thank for sure? I, you mentioned a lot of names. I'm right. That's why I'm writing. So oh, much there's all right. Well, I will, actually, I want to, th- there, are, I want to thank the um, advisory committees for the indoor chemistry and the microbiology, the built environment programs, the microbiology, because these are like the unsung heroes who are like reviewing things, making them better. But there was Gary Anderson of, of um, Lawrence Berkeley labs, Meredith Blackwell, who is at uh, LSU, Rich Corsi, who was at Texas, now at Portland State, Owen White, 
data guru, let's see, and Roberto Coulter, professor at Harvard, one of the best microbiologists in the world. And then the indoor chemistry group, uh, the chairman of that committee, John Seinfeld, one of the most extraordinary um, scientists I've ever had the pleasure to work with. I actually learned so much for him. He was great. Charlie Wesser, who's no, uh, who I'm sure is well known to you. I mean, his papers on, you know, 50 years of uh, you know, indoors and, and what we've learned of, of 20 years, again, really helped me, the indoor air papers really helped me get, um, establish the program. Uh, the uh, Mark Cardillo, who is the head of the Dreyfus Foundation, he knew all, just about every chemist I could possibly imagine. Jack Spangler, who an extraordinary, again, no stranger to this group in terms of understanding exposure and the big pictures. And then finally, an extraordinary physical chemist, and I'll probably say her name wrong, Veronica Vida at the University of Colorado Boulder. Again, and again, just like, so, so these two teams, you almost never hear about, but they really helped guide me and both programs to have really high quality excellence and so on. So I thank them all. I thank all the grantees. I particularly thank the graduate students, postdocs, all the people toiling late at night. Uh, and I know they still are and just keep up the good work. There's lots of interesting things we're gonna learn. Paul, I might have to start another podcast to, to interview all the people that uh, we haven't had yet that I'd <laughs> love to get after this one. Um, you know, uh, we'll, <laughs> We'll keep trying to bring them in, and uh, it's been it's been a crazy year with the COVID. We've we've spent a good bit of time on that, so that put like you, uh, it put us behind on you know right. finishing up other things. So, but I really I want to express my thanks for for you joining us today, and and for all of your work with uh, Sloan in the past, and your your future contributions here at the, at the Hopkins uh, Center. So, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll look forward to talking again down the road. Oh, thank you. I've really enjoyed this. I, you know, hope people have found it interesting and entertaining. Thanks. Take All care right. and be well. Dr. Paul Olszewski, thank you so much. Uh, this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to the Z-Man, my co-host, the Z-Man. John, you got to have faith at the controls. Um, our growing group of loyal listeners, we really appreciate everybody joining us. Our sponsors, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, great to have on some new sponsors this year. And next week, we've got Dr. Alan Zelikoff back. We're going to do a little, bit of a, a little bit of a deep dive into the vaccine issue and some other COVID-related things that uh, Dr. Zelikoff has uh, agreed to join us and help us with. So we'll be back next Friday at noon with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. <laughs>